Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast, a place where you can come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker and welcome to episode 63, The Joy of Finding the Real You. This is a special episode for me because I will be talking to Sonia Thompson Halsey, fellow friend, colleague, wonderful therapist and coach. So I'm really looking forward to you hearing her speak because she has so much great wisdom to share. And most importantly for me, she's a wonderful human. So without waiting any longer, let's get to it. So I am so excited to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Sonia Thompson Halsey, who I've known for some years and whom I love dearly. And she is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a coach and the founder and clinical director of Findings Therapy in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. After 21 years of clinical service, Sonia finds that her passion is to integrate and inspire motivation and healing in every aspect of human life, enhancing connection to the body, mind, and spirit. Through supporting awareness and raising consciousness, Sonia empowers her clients to create goals with intention, trusting their own unique inner guidance systems. Using gifts of one's inner knowing, Sonia supports her clients as they listen deeply to their own inner voice, gaining clarity, direction, and hopefully more peace and joy in their lives. She is intuitive and dynamic, I can speak to that, helping her clients unlock their true desires while having respect for and clarity about their values and their life purpose. Allowing her clients to trust that while they may feel lost, They can always be found if they meet their lives with presence and awareness. And I can tell you that out of all the wonderful people in my life, she was the one who strongly encouraged me to get this podcast on the air and would not let me give up, kick the can anymore. And I just want to welcome you, Sonia, and thank you so much for coming here today. I mean, I don't know if this podcast would be on the air as of yet. If you hadn't strongly supported me and really got on my case about it in a loving way. Oh, thank you, Mary. I mean, you've always been such a hero to me. And when I first met you and heard you speaking about how you think about your clients and what passion you have for each and every person and the whole body of knowledge and how you could reach them, I was in awe from the very, very beginning. And it's just been such a gift to listen to this podcast for so many people. You've changed lives, so many of them. And I'm just happy to know you, happy to be here, and really grateful that I can support you in any way possible. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That is so sweet. I remember the first time I met you, I sat down on the couch next to you, and we were working together, and, (laughs) and you started talking, and I'm like, oh, my. She's one hell of a teacher. (laughs) That's funny. Love how her brain works. And that's when we really started connecting. True. And discovered we were twin souls for sure. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a coach. Like, why was that dream put on your heart? Yeah. Why do you want to help? people thrive? What's that journey been like for you? You know, it's really interesting, because you just brought that up in terms of kind of knowing who I am as a person and, and recognizing that from the beginning, because my whole life, I wanted to be a teacher. And when my mother passed away, and I was going through some papers, I remember seeing my little story of how I was going to be a teacher. And it was probably when I was seven or eight years old. And it never wavered, and that never went away. And so when I started teaching, unfortunately, I think I was so idealistic and unbelievably passionate about it. I mean, I got here, and it was 
incredible. I burned out so fast because it was so incredibly disillusioning because I couldn't help them because there were parents in the way. There were all kinds of administrative issues. And all of a sudden, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, this isn't what I spent my whole life preparing for. I can't achieve, I can't do what I wanted to do. And I left teaching and went into corporate America and spent kind of 12 disillusioned, unhappy years. But the interesting fact about it was that I kept coming back to teaching in that way. I became a supervisor. And it's so nice to even still be in touch with some of the people that were on my staff, because they always said that, that I was a guide, that I was their mentor, that I was kind, that I was patient, that I never passed the buck, that I took responsibility, that I worked with them. And that people were always in my office telling me things and stories. And I've never told anyone that before or whatever. And I was just like, how do I integrate these two paths of leading, teaching, guiding, and providing a space for people. And all of a sudden, it was like, okay, let's become a coach. Let's become a therapist. Let's do that. Because that, I still believe, kind of combines both aspects of that, where I get to work one-on-one, get to help people change, don't have to deal with all the other caca. There's you and the other person in the room or the other couple or family, but you know, just that is an immediacy to it that really was like, wow, this is it. This is what I was meant to do. So that's my journey. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like you return to your passion and, and you couldn't, and you couldn't not. And I just believe so much in returning to your authentic self, like returning to her. And sometimes our journey starts out in a way where we're so certain. Yes. And sometimes our journey starts out in a way where we're so certain that this is where we're supposed to use our gifts. And yet it can be so disheartening when you get there and it's not what you thought it would be. Yes. Yes. But that's okay. The core gifts of teaching and helping people grow and helping people heal. Yes, so certain. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. You know, and I have to be honest, it was really terrifying to really, you know, be stuck there and be so lost so far away to still be able to be good at it and to show up, but always knowing from the get go, I was in the wrong spot. But the what next question, which I think shows up in so many stages of life is what next? What next? What next? And not knowing and that flattening terror of just tremendous depression and anxiety and fear of what next? What do I do now? I need to make money. I need to survive. But I'm so deeply unhappy with this path that I've chosen. And I think without a mentor or without guidance, that can be very hard for anyone at any point in time. Absolutely. The topic we're getting into today, I'm going to let you introduce it. We've been talking about reinventing yourself all month, finding yourself again, what to do later in life. But I want to let you introduce the topic and why it's so special to you and why you wanted to have us have a great conversation about that today. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Because we were just talking about that having, of course, any choice we make about what we really want to do professionally is going to resonate with us personally, especially as coaches, as teachers, as mentors, in any capacity in the quote unquote helping profession, if you will, that there is this idea that I get you. And so that I understand. So when you think about what I was just saying about feeling so lost and so depressed and for for a really extended period of time, every part of my development as a clinician has always been around easing people's fears around normalize, I guess, normalizing that fear that it's yes, we all go through that. And it's just been so fascinating and such a passion of mine to for every life stage. Obviously, now, of course, as I age myself 
And through work that I did when I was working primarily with couples and the idea of midlife just kept coming Mm -hmm. up, the midlife crisis. And what does that mean? And what is that? And how is that different from when you're in your 20s and trying to settle your life and make decisions there? And it's very, very different. And so what is that, right? And why is that, that so often in, again, with work with couples where this became such an, uh, so common to hear, he's going through a midlife crisis, you know, that it was like, what is that? And it always seemed in those days that what it was being referred to then was that this person was going back to adolescence, Right. right? That this was some kind of teenage rebellious period. And it wasn't filled with wisdom. It was definitely perceived as a negative. And I thought, you know, how is this? Why is it so common? And what do these people really need? What do I do? How do I help them? Because that is different than that aspect of personal self and personal mission. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? It seemed very different to me. And yet then I began, the more research I did about it, the more I saw, of course, it's the same thing. It's the same searching. It's just that there was so much fear that it was easier to look backward. And so that was kind of where I got, you know, going on a lot of this developmental interest. Right. How is it that some of the most successful people, I mean, people who have achieved great things in their lives, can hit this wall in their 40s and their 50s where they feel so lost and so terrified, just as I did in my 20s? How is that possible? I'd be sitting there thinking, my gosh, you're you know, at the top of your industry, you've got this beautiful home, this fabulous relationship, these wonderful children, you've done everything (laughs) right, Mm -hmm. right? You're perfect from, from where I'm sitting. Why this deep, deep yearning to go back and do it again, right? To relive your youth, to have an affair with someone 20 years younger than you, to buy the motorcycle, to throw it all away. What is that? What is Mm. that? And so I think that, I mean, that's our topic for today. I wouldn't say that it guides all of my work, but that searching, that journey, it is definitely a cornerstone of my life. And that's one piece of what I've really found interesting. And what's been so great about your podcasts all year long have really been to kind of go back and prepare people for finding themselves. I believe that, you know, this is the work. There's little foundations all along the way that you set in place so that you really can go there with confidence, not fear and terror and depression and anxiety and all of these things that come up at transitional points. So, so well said. Yeah. And for you, it was personal and you've been there. So you have the empathy that someone else may not be able to have of the fear and the depression and the struggle and, and I too, I did a huge research project in my master's program on this upheaval that we tend to do in our lives because I did it myself. I was, right. I was approaching right. 30 and looked in the mirror and said, Oh no. Um, right. And, and right. I think, Oh no, that's such a great way of putting it. Oh no. All in right. caps. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> what have I done? Right. Cause I think in our twenties too, especially our early twenties, you know, we are, can do no wrong. We know everything. We're indestructible. And we have so many years ahead. So it's so easy to right. say, well, I'll go back to school one day. I have plenty of time to do that. Right. But the problem right. is, is that when we get older, time feels a little bit more yeah. finite. 
Yeah, I used to always say to myself, it's okay that you don't know what you want to do. You're so young. You could go to medical school and you could become a doctor and you'd still have a whole life left to live. You know, that whole hugely long process seemed, oh, so what? If I'm going to spend another 12 years in school, like what's the big deal? Whereas, of course, now that would be absolutely like horrific. But, you know, it is. And I don't know if that's a process of having been through it before. But that's just the joy of it now for me. That's what's so great about getting older is to reflect on that and to realize that had I not had issues to overcome Mm -hmm. in the foundational parts of my life and where I've done all the work or lots of work, not all the work, that was wrong, uh, lots of work on myself and sat with people and normalized the experience. You know, there is a part of me, of course, that also has that sense. I wish I had gotten this younger Mm -hmm. from my caretakers so that it wouldn't have been so frightening and it would have been more joyful. Because that is how I feel most of the time, is that it's a joyful process, this process of becoming. The process of not knowing is such a wonderful gift, because if you can be open, there's so much coming in, and so many different things to think about and respond to, and it's exciting and wonderful. And that if I can give people, again, that sense like, it's going to be okay, you'll be all right. But, you know, we talked, you and I, before about, you know, this idea of the shoulds and the milestones. And again, with, you know, reflecting back again, these incredibly successful people who have this midlife crisis, I've often found when you really scratch at the surface, they're almost successful in spite of themselves. Mm. And that because... If you're focusing externally, you're not getting this kind of guidance from your parents, or they're not particularly wise at it themselves, right? And they're outwardly focused on what the neighbors are doing, or what society tells you is success, meaning that their kids got into the Ivy League schools, that they have the right cars and the right house, and they did it all right, right? Based on an external focus. I think I phrased it to you when we spoke before about bumpers and, you know, like in the bowling alley, like it's easy to get a strike when you've got the bumpers. Mm. So they're rolling through life. They hit the, you know, they get the strike, but there's no, if you take the bumpers out, there's no safety. They can't hit the mark anymore. And I think that's what happens is you reach this level of achievement and then there's no other mark to reach And it's incredible, like, yikes, and it all falls away, and you're in the gutter, so to speak, right? The Mm -hmm. gutter of loss and the gutter of fear and grieving, like you said, that, like, who am I, right? right? This wasn't what they promised me. I did everything right. I was a good student. I was an athlete. I was a great, loyal employee. I was a good wife right? I kept a clean house. I raised beautiful children. We always had a hot meal on the table. You know, everything was clean and tidy. And then, but why are you leaving me? Or why, what happened? And you're left with like, this, I, I, how do I call it? What do I call it? The incredible feeling of nothingness. Sometimes when you see people at this stage, there's almost like nothing's left. They've been striving and striving and journeying and fighting these battles, right, to keep the house Mm -hmm. clean and to get the kids to school on time and, you know, all the right, what they thought were the shoulds. I should do this. And if I do, I deserve. I'm entitled to be perfectly happy. I've done everything right. And I'm really mad at you, (laughs) your partner and couples. How dare you? How dare you? I, you know, you told me you wanted me to be a great mother. You acknowledge I'm a great mother. Why aren't you in love with me anymore? Right, <laughs> right? Or right. something like that. And wow, wow. I mean, like, wow, I've been sold a bill of goods. I did everything I was supposed to do. And yet there's no I don't know, golden ticket. There's no reward. Who am I now? And I th- it happens a lot. The shoulds, right? It's Karen Horney, the tyranny of yes, the shoulds. Yes, I was just thinking that. And I think it's Mary. Mm-hmm. Were you? Yeah. And Mary Piper, who talks about how it's so important 
for us to have shouldless days. <laughs> I think it was Karen Horney, or maybe it's not, but someone said, you know, don't should all over yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then Brene Brown talks about external validation versus intrinsic value. Yeah. Boom, right? Yeah. Boom. Yes, exactly. And deep shame in a way. I think you're right. Like, again, Renee Brown, what a wonderful way to look at it, right? The deep shame that lingers there. If I really reveal that I'm dissatisfied when I've done everything right, I'm so vulnerable to criticism and judgment. And what's wrong with you? You've got that beautiful house. You have that great husband. You've got those great kids. Why are you unhappy? What's wrong with you? Right? <laughs> and that voice becomes your own. It's your own voice that's telling you that. Right? I can't tell anyone I'm deeply unhappy. I should be grateful. I'm supposed to be grateful. (laughs) But I think that whenever we go against who we really are, even if we're not sure who the hell that is right now yet, Mm -hmm. we can't feel okay. Can't feel okay. I think the essence of self confidence and feeling like you're living consciously and on purpose is getting things straight with self, no matter how, no matter what that is. Oftentimes right. it'll fly in the face of everything you just spoke about. Like, okay, I've created this great family, this great career. I've done everything right. All the shoulds, all the externals that I thought I was supposed to do. And that's why I think you often see with the midlife crisis, people do the big 180s and they do some crazy yeah. stuff. Like, who are you? Yeah. Right? Who are you? Yeah. What happened to you? Yeah. And then I think it is adolescence, you know, that someone didn't do, they stepped over it, they kicked the can, they did whatever, they just had to be a grown up before they were a grown up. And so I think the 180 is trying to find disowned aspects of the self. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting, because when I've done research on it, and you look back and you go to Jung, who coined the term. He actually, and I don't remember what age he was, but he had his own midlife crisis where he was a disciple of Freud's and split with Freud. And it was, you know, Freud was it. He was the only psychologist out there. So what do you do now? And he, you know, luck, luckily was wealthy enough to be able to cocoon and find himself. And he had a little kind of little hut and you'd see the smoke coming out of the chimney. And I always think of that metaphorically of coming out of his ears because he was thinking (laughs) so hard and becoming who he was. But he just would go into the hut and stayed there for a whole year to just figure himself out. What now? And that's like, you know, he discovered this whole idea exactly like you said of if you are not being true to yourself, that your unconscious is going to take over for you and you have got to get in touch with your authentic self or you're going to die a lonely, bitter person. And that was what he really thought he was Mm -hmm. becoming was embittered and angry and dissatisfied. He was disengaging from his colleagues, from his family. And that's what does happen to us. You're absolutely right. So I think you're right. Like doing all this wild and crazy stuff when we're, you know, older, is exactly that. It is exactly going into that hut and thinking long and hard about who I am. The problem is, of course, right, that it becomes idealized and, and not they're not really doing the work around what does this mean and what is this trying to tell me? <laughs> and that's where we come in, like, let me help you put this in some kind of context, <laughs> right? Right, because otherwise they're just acting out. Or so it looks like on the surface, especially to their spouse and their kids and their best friends. Oh, boy absolutely and they keep going come on grow up you're acting like a child and the, you know again activating the shame i don't know i don't know why i'm doing right. this so stop shaming me <laughs> and that, yeah so they bring them to us right help us <laughs> yeah so i think it is an individuation process And it is a search for truth. And if, like you said, you don't have the tools to have done it before. And there's all kinds of different stages, right? Like that's that's the Erickson stuff, right? There are tasks. There are goals. There are things we need to achieve at every level. And think about how ideal it is when you think about completing the tasks, right? How do you find yourself adolescence, right? How do you find, what do you do? 
right? Do people know? Do people take those risks at 18 that they need to in, in, in an intelligent right. way, right? Instead of just, because you're still following norms. And I think the less, like you always say, that beautiful idea of self-confidence really is being true to that voice. But I think when you're trying to figure out what that voice is, because you never developed it, think about that whole idea of infancy and think about people you meet with the babies that are trying so hard, you know, to be there and to mm-hmm. be present and to mirror the babies. I mean, there you think about developmentally what's going on for that infant is that trust in the universe. Yes. And if you didn't have a receptive parent who had their own issues, who couldn't respond to the crying baby that it freaked them out for whatever reason, or they just weren't there because they had to work. And so you see this child crying and if I'm hungry, no one's going to show up. What do you have as a foundational tool when you're in your 20s and trying to figure out who you are? Because no one cared. Right. right? No one cared for you. You don't trust right. yourself. You don't trust yourself because we're supposed to internalize that as self-trust, aren't we? Yes. Yes. That if I need someone, they will come. And I think it's it's interesting when you work with clients to really place where that happened, right? Because they may have had wonderfully responsive, loving, nurturing, attending caregivers. Then what? Then how do you identify where that loss came from? You think about mm-hmm. toddlers, right? And then mommy doesn't want you to spill the milk right? You're starting to explore, you're starting to stand up. And you've got a very anxious mom who is terrified you're going to get hurt, who doesn't let you fall down. So that you don't internalize trust at that stage. You're not autonomous, you're not secure. You're really anxious because mom's really anxious and you internalize like the world is not safe. Right? So you try to really look at where this disconnect between self happens. I think it's useful. It's useful to really think, where do you want to work? You want to hone in. Always be thinking, you know, I, I, hopefully you'll post these Ericksonian developmental stages for people if they're interested, because if you really read about it, you, can, you will know, if you can listen to your heart, you will know where it happened to you. You will know where you still have work to do. And, you know, is it young childhood? Is it infancy? How do you repair for yourself that sense that I'm lonely, I'm scared, I'm hungry, and no one's going to come, no one cares? If you've carried that through your life, that's where, the, again, I love with your podcast, the grieving, because that gives me the deepest, profoundest sense of grief, because it's preverbal. Mm-hmm. I worked with this young woman in her 30s. Her parents were just very toxic. I think that's what we'll just leave it at that. And she's, she used to say that her pain was pre-verbal. She couldn't, I can't articulate it to you, she said. You don't understand. I can't communicate it. But it's the sense that I'm standing at the side of my crib screaming. And she said, I don't, I know I don't actually even remember that literally, but that's the feeling I have and have had in all my relationships that it doesn't matter. Wow. And I exactly, wow. You know, that no one's going to be there for me to carry that with you. And again, a very accomplished, amazing woman. Always, always seeking that eternal validation that she was okay. And no matter what she achieved, it never repaired that because she'd never given voice to how deep and grieved that and felt it. You know, sometimes people will wonder, how is that helpful? How does that help me? But how does it not help you to say that out loud and to know that? And to give that to yourself and to get that from someone else to say, you matter to me. I hear you. I can relate to that. You're going to be okay. Right. 
And that if I am the child in the crib screaming, that someone hears my voice, my feelings matter, my needs matter. And that yeah. if I yeah. am reaching out, that you'll be there for me. Mm -hmm. And I think developmentally, when you do this work, when you said a, a few moments ago where you will intrinsically know, like, okay, what got messed up for me? I think with my own journey, what I found was wild. Mm -hmm. I had these urges. I think I talked about it in one of the previous episodes this month where I had these crazy urges to color, to roller skate. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> you're a grown up and I want to roller skate <laughs> because there were moments in my childhood where coloring outside the lines was not okay. Mm, Translate right. that into me probably tamping down on my creativity, right? Not taking time. a creative yeah. risk or better said, wanting to, but feeling like I can't like the fear, the wish and the defense, yeah. right? My wish yes. was, oh, yes, big, bold, conceptual creativity, all this crazy, fabulous stuff. Fear is, uh-oh, I'm going to go outside the lines. Now what? Yes. Here's the defense yes, is I subvert that. I'm good. What's in front of me today? Let me get some laundry done, right? Yes. Yes. Button it down. Go do what you're supposed to be doing. My goodness, that's terrible. Something bad will happen to you if you do that. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Be responsible. Get the laundry done. Right. Exactly. Work harder. Work harder. Because that's what's really important. That's how you're going to be rewarded. Right. So yeah. how would you, if I came to you as a client, how would you mm. work with me? I feel like I'm getting ready to have this big midlife crisis. I want to blow everything up. I want to leave my spouse. I'm not happy. Yeah. I do really try, again, to normalize that. I think when you talk back about when you and I first started becoming friends and knowing one another, I really remember you talking a lot about the importance of doing that in the work, of normalizing it for people like, hey, everybody goes through that. And that's the first place is reassurance. Mm -hmm. I want to be those bumpers for you right now. Because what you're feeling is you don't have that and you're feeling unsafe and you're feeling afraid. And so through just being present and normalizing this for you initially and developing trust that I am there, that I can help you find your way. And that is, again, this process that I feel like to give them hope, to give them joy when they don't have it. You know, I think at some point, someone defined me as a cheerleader. You know, I'll be your cheerleader. I'll be your relationships cheerleader. This is okay. And I'll teach you how to communicate. I'll teach you. I'll help you find you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to change at any stage of life. It's never, ever too late. Right? But don't do anything right now. <laughs> I think that's the other part, right? Don't leave your wife. Don't go live in Alaska, right. you know, or whatever. It's like, calm down, settle down, be, be with it, experience it and relax. Because again, it's like, I think as a young clinician, the fear was I wouldn't be able to give them the tools they needed to figure it out. And it's just been as I've gotten older to realize that it's not about any of that. There's no right. There's no wrong way. It's just listening, accepting, because every single person's journey is yeah. unique. The battles they've waged are unique. And so to just be able to be calm and present and accepting of that in and of itself lays the foundation that they didn't have. You cannot soar, you cannot achieve, you cannot find yourself until someone validates it for you, I don't think. I think we need help. I think we need guidance, right? Absolutely, because I was just, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, wow, if I am trying to go through each stage of my development, I mm -hmm. needed parents, caregivers, loved ones who would help be there and be those bumpers like you talked about 
but mentoring and guidance and for them to have enough ego strength for me to find myself. So in essence, what you're offering your clients is I'm going to be like the reparenting piece for you in a healthy way. Because if you had had grownups, like my belief is you weren't able to complete your levels of development, the tasks in those levels of development, probably well enough because grownups who have done it themselves, number one, and number two, aren't threatened by you doing it. You know, there's a big one. another big. So you're offering that reparenting piece to the client. Mm -hmm. And then I personally believe the journey just takes off and unfolds. I know mine did. It was. it was like in yes, spite of exactly. me. It was not because of me. And it was like, just get in and strap in, girl, because you're going for a ride. Right. Yes. And you know what? You just said such a great thing there, because when I think about it, again, as a young clinician and the teacher says, okay, I'm going to just read all this stuff. And I'm going to have tons of handouts <laughs> and things like that, because they're like, tell me what to do. Because that's where, you, again, you never learn to do it on right. your own. And the, to resist that impulse, like, that's not my job. My job is to guide you and to provide you with a safe space and validation for you to become. I'm not going to tell you who you should be because then I'm just like everyone else. You've done this already. Everyone has told you what you should do and you're unhappy. Why do you want me to now tell you? Because I'm somehow smarter than everybody else? No, I'm not. I'm not the manual for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Because they'll never learn to trust themselves until they start practicing trusting themselves. For some of my clients is just paying their own bills, not letting their spouse right. parent them around that. Yes. You know, um, yeah. choosing something different in terms of what they want to do for vacation or right. just making small choices are so empowering. Exactly. You're right. Like, what do you want to eat for dinner? I've literally had couples that they fight about that because they want the other person to tell them every single yep. night, you know, what they're having yep. for dinner. It's like, well, what do you want? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're 70 years old. How can you not know what you want for dinner? Because I, you know, I got married to you when I was 24 years old and you took charge as the perfect housewife and you've made dinner every night and never had to think about it. You know, well, I wonder why you're unhappy now. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So then what stages do you think you see the midlife crisis in, in terms of Erickson's stages? Interesting, right? Because it's, it's, you know, people died younger. Mm -hmm. He wrote this, you know, in the 20s, I think it was, the 1920s, right? So 100 years ago, we didn't live as long. And there's been so much new research about kind of setting the markers at different ages that adolescence doesn't end at 18, it ends at 26. So you really think about, again, the stages are longer. And so he talked about it occurring between 40 and 65. And there is some interesting parallels with the U curve, for example, too, because the lowest point is usually in our 40s or 50s, where people report feeling the most unhappy. And it doesn't start climbing back up and and reaches its highest point for women at 65, right? So there is some parallel even with kind of modern life. And But yeah, so I mean, but if you want to traditionally speak of midlife as occurring between 40 and 65, I think that's still a broad enough target and that the tasks are still the same, right? Some people do get married young and launch their children in their 40s and kind of go now what and have a huge chunk of life left to really be looking at and some people do it later it really i think just it's all individual it all depends on what's going on in your life so yeah but let's just call it 40 to 65 right and then it's like what do i do with the rest of my life now that i've done all the things i was supposed Mm -hmm. to do what do i do now is the question right I mean, I think it's really sad almost when it happens younger in a way, probably it's more anxiety provoking because there's so much life left. So in your 40s, ostensibly, you can live definitely easily 40 more years, right? If you're really lucky, 50, 60 more years, right? But, and it's just going to get better and better, hopefully, you know, it's a lot of kind of life left to live. 
and being unhappy, I think is more terrifying the younger you are. <laughs> I think we can accept it the older right. you are. Although maybe not. Maybe the older you are, there's more panic to it. It's like, okay, I am 74 years old. I'm having a midlife crisis now, and I've got 20 years left to live. Why don't I just stay with what it is right now? How do I improve what is rather than any big risks? Like would I really risk getting a divorce in my 70s? For example, would I really take that risk if that's what felt like the right thing to do? Right, so. right. Yeah. So okay. if you're 70 and this occurs, right, you're on the, that side of the spectrum, I think it can actually be also terrifying in a way because you are older and you're more less likely to be willing to take risks to get in touch with your authentic self. It's much more scary. You don't perceive yourself as having a lot of life left. Maybe at 40, you could reinvent everything and upside down your whole life and still feel like by 50, I'll be right. okay. Whereas if you're 70, I don't know that I'll be okay. 10 years from now, you know, if I see myself living this whole completely different life, but I'll be 80, right? So why on earth would I take any risk right. at all to change anything up? I might as well just keep going and not rock the boat. But I think that's so sad. Absolutely. I think it's sad at any age to really accept being less than what you're supposed to be. But that's just, again, that frames everything I think about in terms of I'm a learner, I'm a teacher. I always think that, what are you thinking? What are you doing for you? And to live where like you just deny that part of yourself. I'm not going to think about it anymore because what's the point? Oh, it just makes me so sad for people. I can't, I can't yeah, imagine. absolutely. I really can't imagine giving up ever. So, and that's, you know, I love, I love this podcast because that is what you're talking about all the time. Keep at it. Don't ever give up. It will be hard sometimes. And that's where we come in. You know, our, our mentors, our coaches, our friends that we trust. Let them carry the load for us sometimes when we just feel like I just don't want to work at this so hard anymore. To remind them that that is the joy. The journey is the joy. And I hate it when people say that sometimes. Oh, I know. The joy yeah. is in the journey. Yeah. Go away. <laughs> yeah. I think it's harder when you're doing it when you're 45 or you're 57. There's another thing. Number one, you already have constraints in place that you probably didn't have at 22. You've got a mortgage that's got to be paid. You know, you have retirement to save for. You have this and that that you may not have mm -hmm. at 21. You have a lot more yeah. freedom, right? So there's that. So you have to figure that out. So that can create stress and yeah. fear for people, right? Anxiety. The other thing is, is you feel out of place because you were supposed to have done this 20 years ago. What the hell right. is wrong Again, with you? Again, there's that shame voice. What's wrong with you? I know. And so there is a lot of fear that it's too late for me. I look like a fool. What would people think? Now, again, I tell clients, I'm like, you are so lucky you were not born 60 years ago. Because here's the thing, especially since the Great Recession, the whole playing yes. field got leveled. People had to start over. There were PhDs, you know, delivering pizzas, right? So I think that some of the social norms kind of got mixed yes, up in a really absolutely. good way. And now it's normal. It's like, what do you mean you've only had one career? Right. Like, what's your second one? What's your third? You know, that reinventing ourselves has become more socially accepted, yeah. I think. No, and you, you know, you say in the podcast sometimes, stop thinking about what everybody else is saying anyway. That's the, what got you in trouble in the first place. We're so hung up on what everybody else you is got thinking. It. So like, my goodness, you got to yep. be 50 years old and like, who cares? This is your turn now. Go do it. <laughs> Who cares? Listening to everybody else didn't make you happy. So if you do it right. with honesty and integrity and purity, everyone can hear your truth when it comes from your heart. So well said. Absolutely. And you don't want to get to 85 because there are some realistic constraints then that you don't have at 42. You know, like what regret do you not want to have right, at 85? Right. 
because anxiety can make us kick the can and do a case of the yeah buts, right? Where we don't pull the trigger on things. So there is perspective that I think we need to keep in mind too, that, you know, you don't want to get to the end and have that regret. But it can be on, you know, again, so much of this is stuff in terms of perspective and what you're thinking. You cannot move anything and still shift it internally so that it feels more meaningful. And it's really Mm -hmm. a simple shift of what is this that I'm learning about this? How can I make this make sense and be exciting? And it it can be very small, yet feel huge to you. So you don't have to throw it all away again, go get the 18-year-old girlfriend and the Harley, and you can still be doing monumental shifting that feels really exciting. You know, I think I think COVID has really put a lot of that into the, the forefront of our minds, though, too. I mean, in terms of like, what would I regret? I never got to see my best friend's mom. I said, I moved back to the East Coast from California, and I would always get to Boston and go visit her mom because she was one of the most influential people in my life in terms of who I wanted to be and contacted her brother and said, when this is all over, I'll come visit her. And it was not, it was, she passed away from COVID. And it was Mm. like, wow. Yeah. You know, so even little things like that of call, you know, there's sending an email to an old teacher that really mattered to you. That'll feel so good. These little things that you can do that again, aren't time consuming. They don't cost anything, but wow. They really can shift everything for you in terms of who you are. So it doesn't have to be something so big to bring you happiness and joy if it's more in keeping with who you are. Right, right. I mean, I tell clients, unless you have a very toxic Mm -hmm. spouse, someone who is so controlling and really struggles with self-esteem issues where they would be terrified if you grew and you're not going to grow in that environment. It's so manipulative. It's so verbally abusive. It's so controlling that that is a lot of times why people will step out of the marriage, right? Step out of the relationship, go run away to where it's safe, to where I can be me. They'll do the geographical, they'll do things. I do think there are some situations where that is probably necessary for them to feel safe enough to, to be by themselves. I talked to a client yesterday and she said, the no contact with my ex for a month, I can Uh actually breathe. I can think clearly because it's that exposure, right? To the toxic. Because this is a really vulnerable thing for people to do. And I'm glad you brought that up. And so to have someone say, what are you doing? You know, who do you think you are? You know, that's crazy. You're too old for that. And why would you want to do that? Why would you want to mess up our relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't fair to the kids. I mean, just, you know, all that stuff. It's really going to be hard for them. But what I tell clients is, unless you have that going on, you know, you might be lucky. You might have a spouse who okay, you probably married someone who really wasn't terribly in touch with themselves either. Let's just say that, right? I mean, like's going to marry like. But they also might not be terrified of doing that journey. And you might be out there first. Usually people don't do this at the same time. They would totally overwhelm the system, right? But they actually can be there and support you and actually would rather get to know the real you, right? Like, who are you really as a person? So I just wanted to bring that up. Oh, and I love that you brought that up because that's another one of my favorite, my little favorite things. But um, Esther Perel, who writes a lot about relationships, great books, and really started talking about affairs and the origin of what that meant and what is, what, why is a person doing this, right? But she has that wonderful right. idea that you could be married five times to the same person. And that has always really been a favorite saying of mine and a thought, right? That if you are strong enough to A, do your own work and you allow your partner to do their work, you will evolve. If you're a human being, you're going to change. That statement that you're not the same person I married 40 years ago, thank God. Like, can you imagine? (laughs) And so it's like, but who are you now? And how exciting is that? I don't know if you've been watching any of the convention, but when you watch Joe and Jill Biden, who clearly so love one another, 
like he's he describes sometimes she started running marathons or she got her PhD and you can see the twinkle like how proud he is of her there's a relationship mm-hmm. where that was allowed and encouraged right. and look at how rich and deep and multi-layered of a relationship they have with one another and clearly neither of them are the same as they were when they met and they helped each other whether the storms and adversity but supported each other in growth as well and were brave enough to take that out their own journeys it's very beautiful to watch it really is so what if i come to you as a client and i don't know where mm. to start start at the beginning right <laughs> mm. <laughs> kind of in buddhist we start at one right just what are you feeling <laughs> what are you feeling Mm. How did you end up here? Right? What's it like? Right? Where do you think that came from? And you start to fill it out. But again, every single small step along the way is validating. I understand. And if I don't understand, tell me more. Right? It's harder, I think, because with the therapist hat versus a coaching hat, I am so steeped in developmental psychology and and even, you know, Mm -hmm. psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, where, you know, where how this get put in you. It's very hard sometimes to focus on goals, but I find that that stuff will come out more naturally anyway, even in goal setting and even trying to move forward. I think that that is a kind of a, a razor's edge. And I think it depends on every individual person, how much reflection they want to do on the past and how I got here. Some people really aren't ready from the get go. It came to me in the beginning. I don't want to talk about my mother right now. <laughs> and that's, you know, I can't do that grief work right now. I mean, that's what I'm thinking, right? This, this person doesn't want to go there. Right. So you start small. And you put the, you know, this is the Shamu analogy. You put the rope at the bottom of the pool. So put it there and say, okay, I'm feeling really unhappy. What would you like to change? What could you do that would help you get there? So I want to be more assertive with my spouse. Try saying something like, I want Mexican tonight. (laughs) See how it goes. What if if they look in horror and shock? Smile at that. Because that's exactly, it's, it's you changing. You've done it. You did it. Kindly and with love. I love that. I'd like Mexican. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Start small. Start small. Meet them where they are. You can't take anyone on a journey if they're three streets behind you. You're not guiding them. You're not helping them. They can't see you. Right. And so you lose them if you try to push them too hard. And. I agree with you. And I think we're ready when we're ready, we're ready for certain things. What I have found over the years, both with myself and then people that I work with, that sometimes they need to focus on some strengthening in the present and building that confidence. And then I think, and and a big kicker with that, that I talk about a lot on the episodes is support, healthy support. The client I was talking about earlier, now she has five people in her tribe. She didn't have that three years ago. That was a huge variable. She's getting all this great mirroring and all that. And then she could do the deep grief work. I don't think we're going to fall apart until we have people that can hold us up. I mean, fall apart is a strong word, but I think we're not going to do that vulnerable digging. Ironically, until maybe we're stronger in our present day life. You know, like we feel like we can metabolize that. There's a framework and a structure to do that. I just think our psyche knows. But I think you can provide that for them, that all of a, you can be the first person ever to see them and hear them and they can trust you. And then they'll say, okay, I'll take a risk and trust somebody else. And they can grow their inner circle. But their inner circle may have no one in it <laughs> until they need you. Right. <laughs> You're right. That is often the yeah. case. Because hilariously, if they had had that, they may not be coming to see <laughs> you, perhaps, Correct. right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. Again, I've said it earlier, but I believe it sincerely is that everyone's journey is individual. Everyone's story is unique to them. 
and to you know the shoulds and the terror that they're doing something wrong that they're the only person in the world that's ever thought that the more isolated and more damage that's occurred in their life that how scary that is to utter the words to you you know you sometimes you're sitting there in a room with someone who really has had a lot of trauma and for them to tell you these things, like the girl I mentioned earlier in the crib where she has, how, it's pre-verbal. I cannot even explain my pain to you. Like, wow, right? I've never told anyone this before. I've never shared this story with anyone. They've lived with this because they think there's something so wrong with them that they deserve to be so unhappy because this happened. And so, again, it's just, no, you can trust me. I think you're fine. I think you're wonderful. I think you're normal, right? Right, right. Because what happens is I think we can develop belief structures. Mm -hmm. Thoughts are things, beliefs make them so. Because I've thought it long enough and I've cemented it. And backed it up with all right. this crazy irrational evidence in my head, right? <laughs> but that's a whole nother that's a whole nother episode. But I can form beliefs, right? I can't trust anyone. Right. I can't use my voice. Right. It's too late. And like what you were saying about the narrative in your head, you also find the evidence because that's what you're you're looking for. Right. So if you're looking for it, you're going to see it. So, oh, yeah, I got fired. Uh, that my boss told me I was an idiot or she said I was bad at this or I was bad at that or I made right. this mistake. Oh, see, that wasn't successful. That person didn't listen to me. They're just like everybody else. How dare you tell me that I can be honest when this is what happens? See, and then, <laughs> <laughs> OK, then have you ever had an alternative story? Has anyone ever not done that? Well, of course, right? People aren't constant. Oh, oh, slow down. Feel that for a minute. Write it down. Remember that teacher in third grade who really said you had beautiful handwriting, right? <laughs> Write that down. I sometimes encourage my clients to keep a box or a jar with little snippets of paper where they write down a nice thing that someone said. That's where you were seen. And then when they're feeling really crummy or they've hit an obstacle or they've been hurt, shake it out, pull those things out and read them and remember, feel it, what it felt like when that person said that kind thing to you, when you were recognized for being mm. good at something and feel the weight of that. That's who you really are. And that is who you want to be. This other stuff, it's all noise. But it's noise that you were looking for, that you were focusing on. But don't wow. focus on the good stuff because you've got your victories there. They're there. And that's who you are. And that's who you want to be. And that's how you always want to feel. Wow. Right. Right. Yeah, because you get so steeped in the narrative that everyone else is telling you. Your shoulds, right? And that you really have a picture of some person you're supposed to be. And oftentimes it has nothing to do with who you really are. Right. Oftentimes that's the problem. Right. That's why people have panic. That's right. why they have depression. Yes. That's why they have so many somatic issues. That's why they have anger outbursts. And the list goes on, right? And I love how you talk about that in some episodes, the somatic aspect of it, where, you know, you really realize what a toll it takes on your body to live in that shame world. Oof. Right. Oof. Yeah. And how they self-medicate it with alcohol and drugs and work and food and TV and <laughs> the internet. Wow. Right. Wow. Yeah, how scary it is that those become their bumpers. Back to that analogy again. Right. Like how scary it is to fly without your bumpers. <laughs> yeah. I really wish and hope and continue to just want that what's going on in your podcast to get out there because you're such a, a tremendous guide you are so patient and kind and i and then there are the tools there and the notes you know go back to the beginning if someone's just listening for the first time go do the work and take your time don't do it mm -hmm. all at once if it's too overwhelming 
and you know, but do it because it's it's there and it will it will it will get you where you want to be. It's just so wonderful. I mean, it's so practical. Your advice is so wise and funny and helpful and kind. It's it's really great. So I hope people go back and really listen to everything. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did that on purpose because probably from my own experience, I mean, I think we, we teach others what we have learned and what worked best for us. And I always try to remember just because it worked for me, maybe not for everyone, but I have always found it helpful like you said earlier, when things were normalized, Mm -hmm. when there was a valid reason why I struggle with X, like, oh, because of this and that, and here is how I can get better at it. Here's how I can fix it. Right. You know, I I always say the hope is in the work. Just do the work. Just do the work. You could do this. It's not rocket science. When you get to the other side, you know how clients tell you like, oh my God, Mary, if if I had known this 20 years ago, because the regret that always comes up, like, yeah. what the hell did I do this long time ago? Why didn't we go to therapy before? Right. <laughs> right. I know. I know. But you do, again, you do it when you do it, when you're ready. You do it when you're ready. But you're right. I think that someone providing normalization and some guidance, yeah. and these are some things you might want to look at. Yeah. That is why I wanted to do the podcast. Because mm-hmm. over years of doing groups and working with couples and families and working with individuals and just seeing these universal things that right. keep coming up for people, I'm like, oh, come on, right? If that person struggles with boundaries and it's causing this and that in their life, do the flow chart, why would that not right. cause similar yeah. issues for the, their neighbor or the next person, right? And so I do think that there are is a lot more objectivity in psychology than we give it credit for. Not that we don't all have our different journey and different flavors of things, but I do think there are some objective pieces that are kind of universal. Yes, exactly. You know, it's interesting because someone at one point in time said something, a client said something about how she saw her whole family as being this whole family in this big mud puddle. And that what we were trying to do was to discern which body in that puddle was hers could I figure out the outline of which was hers so there's right there's the universality which we're all in this big giant mud puddle and then there's Mm -hmm. our individual pods that make us uniquely you right so the commonalities are there but you have to do the work to make it yours yes to heal in the way that you need to be healed so that's yeah that's what's so great about what what you're doing is I'm going to help you find you. And I think that's what we're all trying to do, Right, is help people find their way. I agree. Hence the name, hence the name of the practice, Findings. <laughs> I love that name. Yeah. And it's also the idea of, you know, it's also a word for jewelry making. The two clasps that hold people together, the clasps are called the findings. And then you put the beads. Oh, wow. But it's the thing that holds the, the piece together. So it's also got that literal meaning also. I can hold you together. (laughs) And you'll find you, and I'll find you, and you'll find you, right? (laughs) That is such good stuff. So what what is one thing, if I asked you, that you want our listeners to walk away with today if they grab nothing else from our conversation? What would you want to tell them? I think hope and joy, again, sounds so corny, and yet really that... This process should feel joyful to you, that it shouldn't be fearful, and that if you're not working with someone else or finding someone, a good, healthy person, that you can be bouncing these things off from, you won't find it as joyful. Mm. And I don't want it to be scary. So I think that that's what I hope people take away from this that the process of becoming is joyful and it's a wonderful thing and it will enrich your life and everyone around you as well. When you are more authentic, everyone else around you will be forced to rise up to meet you or you leave them and let them take their own path and move on. (laughs) Go on another. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then ironically, of course, everyone around you is going to feel so much better and safer and drawn to you because there's not a lot of defenses to work through anymore. Mm -hmm. 
It's the genuine you. You're going to have deeper and more meaningful relationships. Life is right. going to become richer in that regard, like you were talking about earlier. Right. And that's the funny, you know, I keep saying there are gifts in COVID in this COVID situation as well. And that is, yeah, you're spending a lot more time alone, right? You just are. You can't be as busy. I mean, a lot of people are really struggling with that. Yeah. Where they start these massive projects and they're busy, 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 because of course they're trying to avoid this downtime and the fear of what's going on in the world right now. It's very terrifying. Yeah. And what's going on with me? But if you just switch it, it's a gift. It is a gift. This time is a gift to you, right? Mm -hmm. How many times up until now have you said, "I wish I had a morning off that I could just do nothing," right? Well, then then do just nothing and see what comes up for you, mm. right? It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You know, if you feel, well, I'm not getting anything done. Of course not, because your brain is working so hard not to be afraid mm. of how what's going on out there. And it's, it's registering all of this noise out there, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. So why not get in touch with it and talk to somebody else about it too and share it? Right. Rather than fight it, because it's right. exhausting to fight all this stuff all oh, the time. It really is, especially alone. And and so in that vein, I really encourage our listeners that if you're finding yourself in this place and you would love a supportive, caring coach to guide you, and she is one, you can find Sonia at her website at www.findingstherapycenter.com. By the way, I love her message on there. It says, when you are lost you have the chance to be found. Don't worry, I'll have that info in the show notes at ownitpowercast.com. There I will also put the links to the two articles that she referenced in our conversation. And you can reach out and connect with her there. And so, Sonia, I just want to thank you so much, so much, so much for being here today. I always learn so much from you every time we talk. It's hilarious because it just, you know, it's so synergistic and it's so value added. And I love that you're just such a like-minded soul and how safe you make people feel in your presence. So I know that people who come to work with you will feel as safe and as loved and as lovingly challenged as I have being your colleague and friend. I can only imagine, you know, how amazing it's going to be for clients and how far you can walk them, because I know how far you have walked people. Oh, thanks, Mary. I agree. I feel the same way. And it's always just so, so exciting to listen to your podcast, to see what you're doing with all this wisdom that I've known you've always had. I'm so proud of you and so excited for the world to be able to tap in and listen to it. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. And we'll have you on again sometime soon. So thank you for joining us today, and I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sonia. And I hope you contact her if you're looking for a loving, caring coach. So may you stay healthy, grounded, and hold on to hope. You have to hold on to hope. Keep finding the good in yourself, and I challenge you to find good things in your day and in others. Be there for each other on the journey and let us be there for you too, because we're here. So remember, pay it forward, keep focusing on you, and I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you could begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now so you can really own it later.